Anyone who's tried to get an auto loan or a mortgage or any kind of personal loan has seen they have a FICO score. This measures individual credit worthiness. A basic FICO score ranges from 300 to 850, with a higher score tending to mean the borrower can access more credit at cheaper interest rates. FICO scores have been around for 35 years and are so widespread that 90% of top lenders use them. Landlords often also use FICO to assess renters and insurers use it in underwriting decisions. The problem is, is that it's far from perfect. The FICO score calculation mainly looks at how much of your available credit you've used, how timely you've been in repaying loans, and what kinds of credit you've had. It doesn't account for recent changes in financial health, such as switching out jobs, as there's often a lag before FICO scores update. The limited variables used means that data points like earnings potential aren't factored in, making FICO scores especially restrictive for young adults without much credit history yet, for example. So a couple of fintech companies are trying more sophisticated ways to assess credit worthiness. One company is Upstart, founded in 2012 by a team out of Google. I went on Upstart's website and was asked the usual questions like my income, but also additional ones like where was I educated, what did I study, and what's my position at my current employer? Upstart went public on the Nasdaq in 2020 at $20 per share and a market cap of about $1.5 billion. And the stock price has been on a roller coaster ever since, reaching a high of $401 in October 2021 before dropping to trade over the past 52 weeks in the $20 to $90 range. Upstart most recently reported third quarter revenue of $161 million up 20% versus last year, along with new funding agreements. We sat down with CEO Dave Girard to dig into how Upstart's products work, why some on Wall Street are skeptical of AI in fintech, and where growth comes from next. So Dave, let's start with the basics. What is wrong with the personal loan market in terms of measuring people's credit worthiness? And what is it that you guys set out to do to fix it when you started this business coming out of Google in 2012? Well, the personal loan market is really just a starting point for us. Uh, the issues that we saw on credit access actually span virtually all flavors of credit. And that's basically that the, the systems used to evaluate who should get a loan and at what price, I mean, are quite antiquated. The, the, the credit score was invented more than 30 years ago now. And it's still kind of been the state of the art on can I get a loan at what price, what size loan, et cetera. And coming out of Google, we really thought, you know what, there's got to be a better way U using a lot more sophisticated math, a lot more data, what's become known as AI to make much more sophisticated credit decisions to better understand risk. And the impact of that would be dramatically improving credit access for almost everyone. So let's talk about what that means in terms of credit access. I took a look at your website, Dave, and I saw that Upstart, you guys talk about having 38% lower rates typically. So that's the interest that I'd be charged as the borrower. You talk about 91% of loans fully automated. Oh, this blew me away. 101% higher approval rate than traditional models. What are the different kinds of inputs that you are using in your data analysis to assess someone's credit worthiness that's different from that just the good old FICO score? Sure. Well, well most lenders, um, they don't just use a FICO score. They use a FICO score and maybe... 10 or 11 or 12 other variables they might get from a credit report, like how many trade lines you have outstanding and how much outstanding debt you have, et cetera. Um, our model uses more than a thousand variables. And you can think of all sorts of information about your credit and, and your use of credit in the past, also about where you work and how long you've worked there. Um, just, just a ton of information, actually, where you went to school and what you studied. So we're really trying to build more of a 360-degree understanding of the person, really all in the interest of finding more ways to prove that you're credit worthy. And that's essentially what our model does, is it keeps it keeps mining and finding new ways to prove credit worthiness. Because in the real world, you know, about 50% um, uh, of the country has access to prime credit based on their credit score, the type of credit you could get from a bank, about half the country. But more than 80% of the country has never actually defaulted on anything. So you have this major discrepancy between who has access to credit and who really should based on the real data. I remember when AI started to make moves into credit analysis, Dave, and there was a lot of chatter, it was speculative chatter, about whether completely different variables, like an individual's social media profile and the activities we seem to be doing there, or what our shopping habits were, would start to make their way into these kinds of models. Does Upstart use any of these really non-traditional variables in its analysis? 
No, I mean, we're never one. There's plenty of information that's that's much more obviously useful. You know, if people make their rent payments, things of that nature, then going into esoteric things like social media. Also, it really just there's no basis for using it. How would you know what you know, you whether or not it actually is predictive in any sense. So we don't really use anything that you would think of in that sense, social media or uh, of, of, uh, data of that like. You, you talk a lot in the Upstart materials about using your models as a way to fight bias and that there's been endemic biases in a lot of credit issuance. Talk to us about what the problem has been and, and what you guys are doing so differently. Well, credit access has always been skewed for sure. And some, some of it is just, you know, the inputs, meaning, um, uh, you know, some demographics have lower income historically than others. But, you know, credit score is, is one of the more biased uh, tools out there. Uh, historically, about 30 percent of black Americans have credit scores in the lowest decile of the U.S., and that really limits access to credit. So using such a simple tool as that uh, tends to have a lot of bias in it. When you start to look to other ways to prove creditworthiness, as I mentioned, uh, whether it be someone could be a nurse or they could be in the military, both of which are high indications of, you know, you're going to be employed, you're very unlikely to be become unemployed, uh, things like that that are just indicate credit credit worthiness are just different ways to, to prove someone's credit worthy. And so we can actually reduce bias by the use of AI. You've also got this overlay, which looks at the macroeconomic environment, Dave, the, the UMI. Talk to us about what that is. Sure. Well, one of the things we learned in the last couple of years is when the economy is changing quickly, your lending models need to respond very, very quickly. And one of the things that's very hard for a lender is to separate the idea of the risk of an applicant and of a loan from risk that is endemic in the overall economy and how that's changing. So what we've been able to do over time is to actually unbundle these and separate them and really better understand how is the economy today impacting the performance of credit. And this is what we came to call the Upstart Macro Index. And we publish it uh, publicly, so it's available. And it's just really been a good way to understand what's gone on in the last few years, particularly a lot of um, really unusual sort of outcomes from the pandemic, the stimulus, the de-stimulus that happened after when the pandemic was, was ending, et cetera. So a lot of um, you know important for lenders to make smart decisions, not just gut-based decisions, but data-based decisions on their lending programs. And that was led to us to the development of Upstart Macro Index. And what's the index telling you today about the health of the American consumer? Well, the American consumer actually, and, and this is a little counterintuitive, uh, unemployment rates are still near historical lows, you know, in the range of four, a bit over 4%. But at the same time, Americans are not as financially uh, well off as they have been in the past. The way we understand this is essentially they're, they're, they're spending more than their income compared to historical norms. The personal savings rate is a, is a is information the Federal Reserve publishes regularly every month. And historically, the personal savings rate in the US, which is really just, just measuring all the income minus all the expenditures, and the net is the savings rate. And that savings rate is typically and historically in the 8% range. Today, it's, it's, it's more like 4%. And that is really Americans who are still kind of, maybe it's a little bit of post-COVID uh, revenge spending or something of that nature, but their spending habits have gone up. The government stimulus is long gone. And there's been inflation, of course, and inflation uh, has, has made that a bit worse. So that nets out that today default rates are still significantly higher than they were in a normal sort of long period of time, probably in the range of 50 percent higher from our point of view. And um, that's that's something that our system adjusts for. So it's uh, part of like why we built UMI is so we can properly you know, calibrate to that type of uh, information. And Dave, is your analysis able to capture buy now, pay later balances? that consumers have got outstanding? Because I know that's been a bit of a gray area. Not all folks trying to assess credit worthiness have been able to get their arms around how much is out there and who's got it exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Buy now, pay later is a, a new form of credit. And for the most part, um, they, do, they don't always report to credit reporting agencies, which is the only way that we would have visibility to that. Some of it is really just what they kind of describe as pay in four. You just pay it off pretty quickly. 
which isn't much different than you know a 30-day grace period on a, on a credit card. So that's no big deal. But if they end up having longer-term, you know, significant credit balances that they're carrying, uh, ultimately it's important for the whole system that that become in, that become visible to all, because you don't want people getting over indebted and in a place where they can't you know afford the loans that they have. So, Dave, to take a big step back at Upstart, you've talked about the ways in which you assess credit worthiness better than traditional models. Let's talk about now how the loans actually get issued. You guys don't carry a ton of loans on your own balance sheet. You made the decision, for example, not to acquire a bank. So you're using other people's money. You're providing the underwriting tools, but it's other people's money that's actually being distributed to consumers. Talk about that decision. Why did you decide not to become a loan issuer yourself? Well, I, I think for a lot of reasons, you know, banks uh, are regulated in a very specific way. They have the unique ability to take deposits and make loans from those deposits. And with that goes a lot of responsibility and really limited ability to take risk, which is why, as I kind of said earlier, you know, only a, a fraction of the country can actually get a loan from a bank because loans ability to take on risk is, is heavily managed by their regulators. And uh, that's important to know, because if you want to push the bounds of credit, invent something completely new, we all know AI is, is, is new and different, and um, it's, it's scary to some people. So doing that you know, as a bank would be, I think, very challenging. What we've really built is a marketplace with a lot of lenders on one side, as well as credit investors, because when the credit may not make sense for a bank to hold. It can be sold on to a credit investor who's more adapted to, uh, you know, to take on that type of risk and expect the type of returns from it. So in our view, a marketplace structure where there's consumers, borrowers on one side, there's a lot of lenders in various sources of capital on the other. It's actually the most efficient way to, to push the technology forward and to have the, the biggest impact that we can. I saw, Dave, that you'd signed a $2 billion capital supply agreement with Blue Owl. And there's been a lot of discussion about the private credit industry. So non-banks, some cases called shadow banks, moving into capital supply in new and creative ways. Talk to us about that partnership with the private credit industry. Do you think that's going to grow? Sure. Well, you know, I think it's funny the term shadow bank almost seems to me a little comical these days because it just means sources of funding that are not from the banks themselves. But um, private credit has really uh, taken off, you know, independent of Upstart, of course. Uh, and banks have receded in lots, lots of aspects of lending, uh, whether that be in commercial lending, whether that be in mortgages, where banks have really given up market share for a long time. So that's a trend that certainly comes before us. But uh, we began working with Adelia, who's a who a Blue Owl acquired, uh, and it's the sort of deal came together about the time that Adelia became part of Blue Owl. But basically, you know, I think a lot of the private credit market has looked first towards direct lending towards companies. That's sort of the bread and butter of of what private credit is. But I think that's also become you know quite heavily competed. And so they're also looking for other classes and sort of asset-backed products like ours, which is consumer loans, is just another category. So Blue Owl's become an important partner. We have skin in the game. We co-invest with them, which is a structure that we um, decided to move toward a couple of years ago, really to ensure alignment with partners and to make sure those partners would be with us through uh, whatever economies we face in the future. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about your recent earnings. Came out last week. It was a fantastic quarter for you guys. Your revenue, 8% beat on the top line. Earnings per share, 57 beat versus 57% beat versus expectations. What were some of the highlights as we break down those numbers, Dave, that drove the acceleration in your top line and drove the improvement in margins? Sure. You know, I think people leap to the conclusion that, you know, the Fed dropped rates 50 basis points, another 25 basis points recently. Maybe it's just an improving environment. And I, I would say that that was a little bit helpful, but honestly, most, most of the win came from uh, new versions of our AI models that are just much more productive, much more constructive. And we launched a model we called Model 18 just a few months ago, which really has a much better to separate risk, much greater ability. What that generally means is when our models get more accurate, 
we end up approving more people at lower rates. And, that, and that's generally how we grow as a company. Um, so lots of things contribute to it. We are a model-driven company. So there's just always new versions of our technology coming out. They lead to higher levels of automation. They, uh, they lead to more people getting approved, hopefully to lower rates. And as the technology continues to get better, that's that's always you know been the basis of our growth, and we're finally getting back to it. I think um, you know it's been a, not a very conducive lending market for a couple of years. Uh, you know, 2023 there were bank failures. There's just a, a loss of liquidity across the banking system, um, but all that really has started to improve. And at the same time, we've been working on the fundamentals of our technology and our business. And I think finally this quarter, the earnings we reported um, uh, just last week, it really uh, started to just all come together finally. Let's give you a bit more of a victory lap on that, Dave. Revenue was, in, was up 20% year over year to $162 million. Transaction volume grew 30% year over year. Now, you did touch on how the models have improved your conversion rate. I saw that went from uh, about 9.5% to 16 and change percent. So your conversion rate's up. But how much of the volume growth is because A, you've got new sources of capital, so you're able to actually issue more loans in the event that you want to. B, how much of it's um, because you're seeing uh, demand coming more from that stressed consumer who's outspending, as you said, relative to historical levels, where you said the saving rate's down to 4%. If you're issuing more to consumers who are more stressed, what is the risk that the quality of their credit worthiness is not as high as perhaps you would want it to be at these bigger volume levels? I think at the consumer level, we haven't really seen, I mean, there's almost, it feels to us, there's almost a constant, uh, consistent level of demand for credit. It doesn't sort of waver that much, although there is a bit of seasonality to it. Um, so I don't think it was sort of a swell in demand from consumers. I think the important thing about what we do is really identifying the the appropriate amount of risk per applicant in any scenario. So if somebody is heavily indebted and, and really trying to like refinance, et cetera, our models understand that. If they've only been if they're not employed or haven't been employed for very long, the model understands that. So you know understanding the macro environment is important, but even more important is understanding the specifics of an individual who applies and the models are particularly good at that. So uh, we, um, you know, it's really not a, a, a function of more demand causing a swell in growth. Really, again, just a, a, the models when they get much better, the conversion rate, the, the ability to get people through the funnel uh, and to get a loan uh, improve a lot. Let's talk about the reaction of the market to the strong earnings report. You had your share price go up nearly 50% in one day, to your point a little bit, the Fed news helped that. Right this moment, you're north of $60 a share. You IPO'd at $20 a share. But I want to touch on what some of the Wall Street analysts are saying about Upstart, Dave. I have in front of me a Morgan Stanley report, a Goldman Sachs report, both issued after your earnings came out. Despite the strength of your results, both have Upstart as sell rated, One's got your price target at $12, the other at $13.50, which is a massive decline that's being implied relative to where you're trading today. Their concern is that in scaling, there's potentially lower quality credit over time. What do you say to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley? What are they missing? Why are they so disconnected from where your share price is, is today? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I think they lack a fundamental understanding of our business and who we are and how we do what we do. Some of them are new analysts or they're just analysts that maybe they have too much to do. I don't know. But, uh, you know, th we actually have a lot of analysts who have, have moved us to a buy rating. Uh, a lot, the majority of analysts have actually moved prices up pretty significantly in, in the closer to the range where we are and, and some above where we are. So, you know, we look across all of them and say, we're, we're the type of business that is hard to understand. Performance and credit is something that proves itself over a long period of time. And so there's just plenty of reasons historically, particularly if you come from financial services, to be skeptical that can, there can be really a new and different way to originate credit. And so some of these analysts, they just come from that world. They, they come from 
evaluating banks and, and looking at things and sort of looking backwards. But, you know, AI is a very new and different tool. It really wasn't available in any kind of commercial sense just a few years ago. So I think it's perfectly understandable that there, there, there are those who don't yet understand the potential for it. And maybe, uh, again, it'll just take more time to, to see the results and, and appreciate it. But there's certainly a lot of other analysts. I'll just call out analysts from, from City, analysts from Barclays, that uh, have much more favorable looks on us. Uh, Mizuho is another one. So, uh, you know, you can't get them all. Like I said, I think there is an there are inherent skeptics uh, in the domain of lending that it's always just the same, right? Everything looks good until it doesn't. And everything under the sun's been invented in lending. And we're, we're a very different company. We're out to say, look, no, you can do this in a much better way, in a much more efficient way, in a way that's better for the lender and far better for the consumer. And it's using a tool that suddenly we're all hearing a lot more about, AI. And uh, given what you see in AI these days, you know, from chat GPT and all the, the noise about that, it's not, it's not really a huge leap of faith to believe that it could make lending far more accurate and far more efficient. The first indications that information other than some of the traditional metrics, Dave, could be used to assess credit worthiness. I remember uh, in 2007, right, it, there was a subprime lending in the mortgage space. And then also student loans, you may remember, there was this move into looking at student loans beyond parents' FICO scores, or the students obviously themselves didn't have one mm -hmm. yet, and looking at what their potential earnings trajectory was. It didn't end so well in 2008 in some of those cases, a different kind of asset-backed securitization market. Yes, it wasn't called AI. Yes, there wasn't the level of computational sophistication that you have today. Do you think that we understand those risks better? Do you think for some of the skepticism that we're seeing from Wall Street, it's because there's still a little bit of an overhang of new ways of trying to assess creditworthiness? There's a nervousness that if we're not there yet still, we could be looking at another potentially catastrophic outcome if we get too ahead of our skis? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, understanding risk is always a, a challenging problem. And as you said, in, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there was not the computation, there was not the technologies to make the leaps forward that I think are possible today. Our company really couldn't have existed in my mind 20 years ago. Uh, there just wasn't the basis. Today you have cloud computing, which is a hugely important underpinning that enables AI. Suddenly AI itself has taken off. That's all relatively new. And credit, you know, like you can't prove it in a moment, right? No matter what, you have to originate loans and see how loans perform. So there's a certain amount of time that has to happen. But we're generating, we generate all the training data on our platform. Um, we have the best tra proprietary training data set we have. And at a simple level, I mean, if you could know five things about somebody before making them a loan, or if you could know 20 things about somebody before making a loan, which would you prefer, right? You'd probably rather know the 20. So e even though it's, it will always be imperfect, the question is with much more data, and much more sophisticated algorithms to understand that data, are you in a better position than just using far less data in simplistic algorithms? I think it's almost inevitable that you're in a much better position. The other point I will make, as you noted earlier, over 90% of our loans are entirely automated. That is a very powerful function because when you respond to the consumer quickly, it's not only le it's not only less costly for the lender and for us to originate that loan. It's also, of course, much more valuable to the consumer to be, to get a response in a moment, be able to get that money quickly. It also selects for better borrowers. So you have these sort of secondary effects that I think the AI technology brings to the market that makes for a fundamentally better loan product from the consumer's perspective, both in terms of the price and the process they go through. And that value accrues not just to the consumer, but also to the lenders. You've trained your models on something like 77 million payment events. So your data set is large, Dave. There are potential competitors and actual competitors out there with bigger data sets, whether it's the Visas and the MasterCards who collect similar information, plus have the benefit of seeing who the, what their consumers' shopping and spending habits are, to folks like PayPal that have got billions of transactions they're processing every year. Do, do you worry at night about how those kind of incumbents with massive data sets could come in? Do you worry about other folks like SoFi who are actually doing some of the issuing as well? Where do you feel about your position in the, in the competitive landscape? Um, I, I feel 
Quite good, because I think when it really comes to fundamental application of AI to credit origination, there, there's nobody in our class. There's nobody. Uh, and if you looked at whether it was Visa, whether it was one of the money center banks, um, they they don't have either the risk tolerance or the skill set or, or the desire to really pursue this aggressively. I think they view it. If you're a money center bank, you just want to sort of cherry pick the best of the best and, and have them as your customers. Um, not really interested in exploring how to better understand and better serve, you know, the, the torso of America, if you will. Um, so there'll always be lots of competition, but most of them, I, I think, are not focused uh, fundamentally on AI as a way to create a better product. And eventually they will be, because I think this technology will be so dominant that if you could look a decade in the future or more, what you'll find is that it will permeate all forms of credit. And at some point, everybody, every large bank, every small bank, every credit union will be like, where do we get this technology? Do we try to build it ourselves or do we try to partner with somebody? Well, we aim to be that partner, uh, realizing that some of them may try to build it themselves, but most of them will recognize quite quickly uh, it's beyond their means to do so. And we aim to be the, the partner to those lenders at that time. Let's close, Dave, on building and growing, because that's clearly something Upstart's very focused on right now. You're out in the market raising capital. Tell us what's going on by way of your capital raise and what is your plan for the use of proceeds? Uh, well, look, I mean, we're, we're a fast growing business. Uh, if you looked at us from past our IPO in 2020, you can see the kind of growth we're, we're capable of, of, of delivering as well as profitable growth. And as we, we just sort of look forward to where we want to be, I think it's important that we have just more ballast, more cash on hand, and more a stronger balance sheet to be able to make sure that no matter what happens in the future, we're there. Also, just being able to invest in the AI that we have. So, you know, for us, again, it's not a sort of particular use of funds. We aren't, we, we I think are a, a very efficient company, have always been a very efficient company. If you sort of looked at Upstart compared to its peers, raised probably an order of magnitude less money as a, as a private company, uh, still had most of that money when we came public. Um, so we've always designed our business to be quite capital efficient, and I think that's who we are and who we'll be in the future. But at the same time, I think there is a unique opportunity to be the leader in AI-enabled lending. I think it's an enormously important future for the industry. And even though there's enormous number of skeptics, I think it's pretty clear to more and more people that AI has enormous potential in this category. And we want to make sure we have the, the capacity to pursue things as they become available, whether that be acquisitions or whether that be new product areas uh, that we want to pursue. And for, if you were to go after acquisitions, Dave, what are the kinds of targets that would pique your interest? Well, I mean, I always think of acquisitions as we, when we decide we want to get from here to there, we can build something or maybe we find a, a faster way through an acquisition where there's some talent and capability and product available in the market. So, you know, acquisitions are a bit of like a means to an end that we've decided is an end we want to pursue. And um, so they can be adjacent product areas. Um, you know, we don't have anything in the, in the we're, we're not a credit card product or we're not involved in that part of the, the credit industry at all. Uh, we're only a U.S. based company today. Everything, an entire business is within the U.S. So a lot of potential beyond the border, borders of the U.S. These are just things we think about, but we're quite selective. We've literally made one acquisition in our you know, 12 and a half years of history. So we're not one to run out and, and do these things uh, willy-nilly. But I do think acquisitions can be a very useful tool to accelerate your business when you re really have clarity of, of where you want to be. Dave Girard, excited to keep following you as you continue to build Upstart. Thank you very much for joining that set, folks. Join us next time for the next episode of After Earnings. That was CEO and co-founder of Upstart, Dave Girard. If you enjoyed that episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to our social media and podcast distribution platform locations and join us next time here on After Earnings.